So this is the first of the recordings from previous lectures that Dr. Clavo Hall had delivered. And this particular one focuses primarily on Chapter 23 of the Bronson et al. textbook. And one of the things to note in the first minute or so, she refers back to content from the previous week. Now, during the spring 2019 semester, when this particular lecture was recorded, the content that the students would have covered during the previous week is the same readings that you would have covered during week seven of this course. So when she's referring back to think about the information in the material or the uh, lecture that she had during the previous week, for you that is session seven that you want to look at. And during that week, you may recall, we were looking at Bronson uh, at all chapters 14 and 19, as well as White chapter 17. And with that bit of information, I will turn it over to Dr. Clavo Hall. So now we're going to look a little bit more at uh, implementation science this week. And one thing I have to ask from last week is, uh, do you remember one of the things we said that is uh, different and characteristic about the science of implementation from the science of dissemination. A big difference between we, those two things. We talk about DNI a lot in this class. And what does DNI stand for? Dissemination and implementation. And of those two, which have we determined throughout this class is further along in its development as a science. One of the things we said is implementation as a science has moved further ahead with establishing standardized terminology. More studies are done on implementation science than dissemination science. So there's more information, both qualitative and quantitative. And implementation science has more evaluation uh, studies behind it than dissemination science, okay? So that is some of the reasons why implementation science is uh, moving along quicker, okay? So we have that, and tonight we are going to look at a few things to look at the evolution of implementation science and look at some of the strategies that facilitates it. And then looking at uh, some of the sustainability issues that you've talked a little bit about and its impact and still assessing the role of uh, partnerships in both dissemination and implementation. So we're not trying to leave dissemination behind, but we want to be aware that it is in a different space than implementation because of uh, progress and because of how scientists are working on it, okay? So the next thing we will uh, look at is looking at the evolution of healthcare. Do you remember, this is, uh, I believe we were in chapter 23 of Brownson. What are some of the reasons uh, that uh, we started trying to change how we look at uh, the problem of healthcare based on what you read in chapter 23? Anyone? I want to ask what are, we see some things on the slide here. Tell me a little bit about some of these discrepancies. As we look at the slide here, some of the things that Kyle talked about, yes, it was driven by physicians. And what were some of the problems with having healthcare being driven by physicians from some of the things that you're seeing on this slide? Anyone? Uh, I, I appreciate that. I agree with that. I would say if I'm a doctor in the 1970s, what is my thought about what Eloisa just said? So you're, you're right. Doctors don't like uh, Eloisa's idea of diversity. Uh, however, she's right that 
if you're just using the opinion of one person or one group of people, of like-minded people, the likelihood of getting the best outcomes are not great. And during those times, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, while each physician group or types of physicians uh, were doing their uh, medicine their way, you had problems like costs going through the roof. You had problems of uh, Dr. James likes to do his appendectomies with sutures uh, that were made from chrome and titanic, and they cost three times as much as the other sutures that all the other doctors used. But if that's what Dr. James wanted, and you wanted him or her to keep bringing his or her patients to your facility, you kept spending the money to get them there. The other thing they found was this geographic variation. Why is it that when Mrs. Jones gets an appendectomy in Mendocino, she has to have an MRI, a chest X-ray, a battery of labs before they will ever even consider diagnosing her. And when it happens in San Francisco, they use the criteria and do an ultrasound and can move to a protocol of if she's going to have surgery. That kind of disparity was not being helpful to healthcare in general. So those kind of inconsistencies led to uh, what Kyle says, that didn't work out. It did not work out. And it was interesting because some of the things that, uh, some of the ways that these problems were thought to be addressed is they didn't originally say, let's stop focusing on the doctors and look at some of the people Eloisa uh, brought up so that we can have more diverse input. One of the first ways they thought to address this problem with healthcare is, anybody, <laughs> before I say so from your reading, when trying to uh, accommodate physicians only was not working for healthcare what was one of the first things they tried to do in general? How about continuing education credits for the doctors? And how about uh, nice theater tickets, a good golf game, maybe a small trip to Oahu, okay? And all of that was thought to, maybe we can change how they are working in silos if we tell them a better plan, and then incentivize them with these things. And it goes back to what Kyle says, that didn't work, okay? It didn't work. And finally, when we started getting evidence from the IOM, the CDC, and other credible entities that we can't go on like this, we can't continue to uh, try and just focus on one group of people, did they, begin to, uh, they begin to start looking at other ways of looking at healthcare, which become more in line with some of the things that Eloisa spoke of. So then we started talking about implementation science, okay? Implementation science, looking at ways to get the, uh, what's going on at the bench to the bedside. So implementation science being the study of what happened after you've adopted the EBP, what's going on in the organizations, and it addresses the gap that moves us from what goes on at the bench to what goes on in the bed, at the bedside. And the point that was made is we have wonderful work going on in the laboratory. We're making grand findings and very uh, effective, we're finding effective treatments. But the second slide says, no matter how much you try to apply that treatment that you found in the laboratory to any number of types of mice and rabbits and piglets, how much is that going to tell you how it's going to work here? You can never predict what's going to happen with a human being by doing studies on even uh, animals that share a lot of human DNA characteristics. 
you're not going to be able to get to this real world situation with this. And no matter how genius what's going on here is, if we can't get it to these people, what happens to humanity? So then we talk about the implementation science framework and we look at things like bottlenecks and gaps of, and we try and develop and implement strategies and follow this particular framework. Looking at using that lean framework, it helps to identify either gaps in the process that they're not, uh, they're, they're not using efficiently or bottlenecks in the process that are, that are in, impacting or being barriers to, for, the, for the throughput where they can't work as efficiently. An example, uh, they've made a, a, they use the lean to maybe make sure that all the med surge patients are discharged by 1230 in the afternoon so that they can get them out, get the rooms clean, and, and get new patients in. But maybe there's a bottleneck that is discovered by Lindsay's lean process, where, yes, the people were discharged, but pharmacy's not getting them their medications until 2.30 in the afternoon. So even though they've done the gimbal walk and said, we've got a process for getting these people out on time, bottlenecks in un Oh, unforeseen uh, areas can stop the process. And again, as I said, when these things happen, it is resources uh, and money being wasted when you don't have the throughput that you envision. So looking at the implementation science, they give you ways to be able to identify these type things and lean uh, is one of the methods that you can use to see that. As she talked about, well, we go through and we come back and, and say what was done that adhered to the process and what was done that didn't. They had a way of measuring what should have been done and the, they had the green dots, red dots and deciding if it was done. And here is where the manager utilizes that information that they gain from the team. The next thing is we look at implementation science and uh, DNI as ways for us to be able to bridge the gap between the evidence, what we know is the right thing to do, and reality, what it is that we're doing, okay? And that is what you're trying to narrow in implementation science. So when you're talking about trying to narrow the gap, you want to ask questions, nurse practitioners, of looking at the appropriateness of the change you want to make. When you look at a clinical practice guidelines, remember the VA article? They started with a set of guidelines and trying to see if they were appropriate for this VA environment that they were looking at. Now, that is a translation. If we have a set of guidelines and now we're applying it to a particular setting or population, that is translation. Where did we get this, this term practice parameters? What, where'd that come up? Why, why are we looking at that term? It was in your readings. Practice parameters were, was the term put in place by physicians because they did not approve of the term clinical practice guidelines. Remember how we talked about physicians are averse to practice guidelines because some of them feel like you're trying to tell them how to practice medicine and surely you didn't go to school as long as they did and uh, they are not happy with people telling them how to practice. So interestingly, physicians chose the term practice parameters as guidance to help them. Um, but even if you have a set of practice parameters, that will be 
the beginning of translation. You start with the param parameters, you start looking at the real world situation you want to apply it to, and you look at the questions of feasibility and appropriateness and fit. Okay, uh, we've talked a lot about frameworks and theories. We want to encourage you for every project, especially your EBP projects, you should now be thinking about frameworks and theories that would be appropriate for your particular project. And as they started to get to more of a diverse teamwork and interprofessional collaboration with healthcare, as Eloisa explained it to us, they're focusing on organizational structure and policies. And as you can see, when you focus on these things, it cannot be done with just one group of people. It will not be done. That is where you have to bring other people from the organization in at different levels in different uh, different professions with different skill sets. And you're looking at both upstream factors and uh, downstream factors and midstream factors as well. And something uh, Jenny said, looking at internal and external uh, factors. So everybody see this screen? If we say that we are, does everybody agree, or should I say anybody disagree that we are currently in an opioid epidemic in this country? Anybody disagree with that? Okay. So um, if I don't have anybody disagreeing, imagine this, uh, this diagram and we're thinking about midstream, upstream, and there's a downstream. Uh, I'm going to ask you in the opioid epidemic, who are the stakeholders? Just tell me some of the stakeholders in the opioid, current opioid epidemic. So I've listed six, uh, six stakeholders right now. So I'm going to ask you uh, which level each of these stakeholders fit in this level of impact. And let's start with the patient. Where would they be? Individual, okay. And I would say that you could also put family members there as well. Uh, what would you say about uh, what would you say about EMS? Where would they fit? Okay, it could be the, the mental system. And uh, yes, I would say that. Anybody else? Where do you think EMS might fit? I think I think that's a good place for them. Yes. Yeah. Now, what about pharmaceuticals? What about McKesson? Where does McKesson drugs um, fit? Now, I'm going to name one that we didn't name. The, physician. Uh, let's see. No, we have prescribers. I put physicians under there. Um, oh. What about the Federal Drug Administration? Oh, okay. Macro system. Mm -hmm. And of all of these that we've named, I don't see any one of them that they don't fit someplace in this system that would impact the life and health of the, uh, of the person that is addicted to opioids, okay? So as you, as a provider, because when you finish your education and your certification, you will have the ability to prescribe these medications and you will be on this system level impact. You will be a part of this system. You're already a part of this system, but you're gonna be even more involved when it comes to that part of it. And trying to, and as you can see, note that even those people in the MISO system and the exosystem, they're, they're being impacted by people above them and below them. It is still one system. Okay? 
So it comes with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, respect your position as a nurse practitioner, and I would uh, say that you need to be aware it comes with a lot of responsibility as well. Okay. So. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about comparative effectiveness research. We talked a little bit about this in uh, our readings, and I think Kyle had an article a few weeks ago that was based on this type of uh, research. So we say here, comparative effectiveness research, the generation and synthesis of the evidence, and it's comparing the benefits and harms of alternative methods to either prevent, treat, monitor, diagnose, or improve delivery of care. Okay. Um, and I would say, what do you know in your, to your knowledge at this point about comparative effectiveness research? And why do you think it's important? Let me give you the Institute of Medicine's take on it. The Institute of Medicine in 2009 said comparative, the purpose of comparative effectiveness research is to assist consumers and people like your cohort, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers to make informed decisions that will improve health care at both the individual and the population uh, levels. So it's helping you to make decisions on what medications to use, what devices to use, what treatment protocols to use. And it's focused on impact on the real world. This is beyond the bench, beyond the lab. We're talking about what works in the real world for real people when uh, there are choices. For example, uh, high blood pressure. You're treating a cohort of patients with high blood pressure. And you may have, uh, what is one of the, what is one of the most common high blood pressure medicines you can think of at this point? So you, nurse practitioner, can treat Mr. Taylor for his high blood pressure and he can take lisinopril, uh, this is hypothetical, which will cost eight dollars a pill or he can take metoprolol at three dollars a pill and for his medical condition get relief and improvement of his symptoms from either how do you decide and it gets back to asking the question is uh, is this the best choice? Is it the best fit for Mr. Taylor? Uh, if I prescribe this medication, can he afford to pay for it? Is he going to take it? Uh, or will he take it if I can give him one that he can afford? And for Mr. Taylor, it may not even be money. It may be something else for him. You looking at the big picture of is he going to take the medicine if, that I prescribed for him? And if I can get him the same benefits from both, and I'm not saying go cheaper is better. Looking at the big picture, where the person is, looking at his economic status, his uh, healthcare literacy, looking at all of that to determine, can I help this patient to optimize his level of uh, how, of wellness by making sure things are in place that he will want to take his medication and get himself in the healthiest position, okay? So it's looking at the big picture and comparative effectiveness research says, we are going to vet some of these like choices for you and give you the results of it so that you can have more evidence-based information to make your decision on how to treat your patient. How about my patient is a quadriplegic? Do I want to give him a medication that he has to give himself a shot in the belly four times a day? He can afford as much medicine as you can give him, but his situation requires a different look. And you, as a nurse practitioner, need to have a, a lens that considers all of that. And when we see the term Sir T here, it's 
uh, comparative effectiveness research in translation as we're actually going through that process. And let's look a little bit at partnership. We looked at it a little bit in the article. Um, we looked at it as healthcare today, as I keep going back to uh, Eloise's uh, eloquent description of all the partners that need to be considered. We have uh, healthcare partners, we have uh, policy partners, we have academic partners, and you're looking at this, and the partners need to have learning that's relevant to the real world, because that is what EBP is looking to do, make a difference in the real world. And you want to be able to collaborate and collaborate from the beginning, not just when one or the other group has made a determination that something is a good idea. You want to be able to prioritize and facilitate this uh, transdisciplinary relationship. And the earlier you do it, the easier it is to stay on the same page, or if you start to veer from the agreement, it's easier to get back to it. And developing uh, participatory research situations. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, Professor Moore Harper. She did her doctoral research at Duke University, where she trained uh, diabetics at her church how to better monitor their nutritional status and giving them ideas about that. So she had she partnered with her church to be able to uh, conduct this research and to see how to improve the health of members of her African American church, people who are among the highest to suffer from, I think it was diabetes that they were looking at. So then we look at different types of partnerships. You need to be aware of, is it a multidisciplinary type of partnership where everybody's working to optimize the situation in their own corners and then they're coming back together to bring it together and make it work and there's little inter interaction across the disciplines or there's the interdisciplinary uh, type of partnership where you're trying to combine from the beginning and make the walk together so your methods can include both types or all types of the disciplines that are involved. And then you have transdisciplinary where those members, they uh, start from the beginning with joint communication and exchanging ideas. And they're looking at it from a more holistic type of approach. So as you uh, start with doing your uh, projects, you want to think of one, who do I want to partnership or need to partnership, partner with? It may or may not be somebody that you might like or a group that you might like, but if they're going to help you develop your project, you sometimes have to walk a little while with groups that you may not have chose to, but people, you can learn from almost anyone. So see who you need to partner with, how you're going to partner with them, who's in charge of what, and clear communication to make it an easier walk for you. And then we look at sustaining change. And uh, that is something you want to think about as you work with your, with your project and your partners. How are you going to sustain change, but not just sustain the change, how are you going to measure that the change has been sustained? because sustainability is the extent to which the evidence-based intervention can deliver its intended benefit over an extended period of time. Uh, that's an example that Lindsay offers us with what they're doing with Lean. Even as you look at your projects, think about, do you wanna look at a project that's supposedly already been implemented and go back and evaluate the level of sustainability of that project in the real world. So those are things that you're going to be looking at to improve the health of patients and clients in the real world. So with that, I think I'll stop and see if you have any questions before I release you for your break time. Okay. 
So I will say thank you everyone for joining us and being a part of um, looking at partnership, sustainability, and what's going on in translational research. Okay. It was at that point that Dr. Clavel Hall released the students and let them go on a short break before they came back and started doing a group work activity. And as has been her practice, um, the only thing that she excluded from her prepared presentation was the summary slide. So just taking a look at some of the main points here. Uh, the first is dissemination and implementation research is about taking what we know about healthcare and putting it into practice. And if you think about it, another term that we have for that is essentially translational research. How do we translate research into the specific context in which I'm practicing in right now? So the basic definition of dissemination research and implementation research is essentially translational research. One of the other things that Chapter 23 stresses is the fact that in order for us to have a better understanding of dissemination and implementation research, we need to be able to use consistent terms to describe things and consistent measures or consistent methods to measure specific outcomes. And as Dr. Clavaha mentioned up at the beginning, there's a little bit of an inequity or imbalance between dissemination research and implementation research when it comes to this. So it's important that uh, individuals who are undertaking translational research make sure that they are using a transdisciplinary approach or that they are engaging a number of partners to be involved in the process and that all of the partners have a common understanding of what it is that we're doing and the specific terms that are being used to undertake that particular translational research. One of the final points in chapter 23 is the importance of, or as the slide indicates here, the high priority that should be placed on this kind of translational research because as I'm sure you will all agree, the level of resourcing that you have available in your particular setting or context probably leaves something to be desired. I'm sure that each of you, if we were to sit down and talk about the type of resources that are provided in your particular context, would be able to describe to me all of the things that are missing or that are inadequate or that you could use some more help with. Um, in some cases, it may be human resources. In some cases, it may be physical resources or such as, you know, access to machines or testing type environments. Um, even just the, the speed in which things do and don't happen within your particular context. All of these things are indications of a lack of some type of resource that you would benefit from having. And in healthcare, unfortunately, like so many other public sectors, we tend to be low resourced or under resourced and some areas tend to be much more under resourced than others, both in terms of some aspects of the healthcare profession tend to be much more under resourced, but also healthcare in certain geographic regions or that are serving specific populations tend to be under resourced compared to those that are located in other geographic regions or that are serving other types of populations. And it's this inadequacy of resourcing that makes translational research so important or as the slide indicates such a high priority for healthcare leaders whom you will all be uh, and the conclusion of your DNP and in many cases many of you are already in leadership roles as it is. So translational research beyond just what it is you do for your dissertation project or what you did for your master's project should become something that is a regular part of the work that you do on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. So that concludes our look at chapter 23 in the Bronson and All textbook.